the last decade or so, nostalgia has been a driving force in all media. It's not always coming from a bad place either, after all, certain remakes and re-releases can be a wonderful thing if treated with reverence, but it's hard not to get jaded by the whole affair. It takes a whole lot less effort to sell fans on something that they fondly remember after all. I'm Cy for WhatCulture.com and these are 10 video games that exploited your nostalgia. Number 10, Grand Theft Auto The Trilogy Definitive Edition. As the best-selling game system of all time, chances are pretty high that you or someone close to you had a PlayStation 2, and within that collection was likely at least one of the three classic Grand Theft Auto titles of the era. Trend setting, industry shaping, and just downright fun, you'd be hard pressed to find many people who didn't enjoy these games in some fashion. And Rockstar knew this, even as the series pushed onwards, there was a nostalgic call for the heady, innocent days of PS2 polygonal open worlds. Development on a re release collection of GTA 3, Vice City, and San Andreas took two years to complete, but the so called finished product doesn't reflect this at all. Graphical upscaling was an understandable tool to use on three decently sized games, but the end result is monstrous looking NPCs and broken textures, the removal of draw distance fog totally changes the game's tones, the new weather effects are so obnoxious it makes the game nigh on unplayable, and that's before even getting into gameplay glitches. What's most offensive about this cheap play on audience nostalgia is the fact that Rockstar knew they could sell this on the premise alone. Bully for them then, as they didn't really have to show any footage of the game actually running, because if they did, their sales would have severely tanked. Number 9. Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl The Pokemon franchise at this point will surely outlive us all. Because of how attractive it is to an audience at an impressionable age, it will always bring in fresh new fans. Thousands of people will have had their first Pokemon experience on each new generation, and thus remakes have become a rare but important part of the series. The first three pairs of Pokemon remakes were always very respectful to the source material, but also did a lot to create a fresh and exciting experience with new areas and new mechanics. This is why fans were so hungry to see the glow up of Diamond and Pearl. The original games were admittedly quite flawed, and could really benefit with that extra touch of magic. After years of demanding it, Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl stopped fans dead in their tracks. Concerns were immediately raised with the art style, which, whilst similar to the recent Link's Awakening remake, was distinctly lacking in charm. When the games arrived, the confusing lack of content made the remakes feel like something Nintendo did just to play into the desire rather than truly satiate it. Number 8. Dragon Quest Tact Square Enix are no stranger to paying for the wallet of their audience. We see you, Final Fantasy, all the bravest, but it's always sad to see a once great and oftentimes timid series be used in such a huge, boneheadedly capitalist way. Dragon Quest Tact is by no means the first, but it is one of the latest in the genre of money-hungry gacha games. The most disheartening thing about Dragon Quest Tact is that there's almost something resembling a game here, but it's buried under constant requests for your latest paycheck. If you fail a battle, fear not, as you can pay to revive your team and continue. Want to grind for experience even faster? The best auto-battling selection is behind a paywall. Whilst the game is all about collecting your favourite Dragon Quest characters, and that's the main reason anyone would download it, the absolute best of the best are pay only. No matter how many times you spin that gacha wheel, you'll never get your favourite warriors unless you're willing to part with cash. Overall, Dragon Quest Tact is a pretty ironic name, considering it shows Square Enix's lack of prudence, using the power of nostalgia to squeeze as much cash as they can out of devoted fans. Number 7. Disney Speedstorm on the surface, Speedstorm is clearly designed to be Disney's big step into the ever-present karting space following the success of Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled and the chart-topping Mario Kart 8. With tracks and races promising to reflect the media giant's widespread properties, from Monsters Inc. to Pirates of the Caribbean, it should feel like a celebration of all things Disney, but it also comes off more than a little disingenuous. Whilst the game isn't technically out yet, early looks at Disney Speedstorm reveal that it has a worrying demand for microtransactions or at least mind-numbing grinding. Each character is leveled up individually, but the issue is that the campaign far outpaces your own experience. It'll come to a time where your opponents will simply just be better than you, and you'll either have to choose to grind for upgrade materials or buy them. Oh, and the item boxes? Unlike, say, Mario Kart, the kind of weapons you earn from them also depend on another upgrade route for each individual character. Speedstorm lets players keep up with its difficulty curve only if they plunge hours upon hours into it, farming for shards, or skip the process with a quick payout. All of these mechanics are the kinds of things you'd expect from a cynical gachapon mobile title, not what should be a warm and inviting nostalgic celebration of family-friendly films and characters. Number 6. Back for Blood 
With the big bold from the creators of Left 4 Dead heading on their marketing, you'd think a decent chunk of the 190 people that made the classic Valve co-op zombie survival game were accounted for. In actuality, just seven people who laid their hands on that game returned for Back 4 Blood, but the promotion kept hammering the connection home. Heck, even the name is like the studio is grabbing you and shaking you by the shoulders. Get it? It's like Left 4 Dead. There's even special zombie types and everything. Thankfully, despite its flaws, there's a lot to like about Back 4 Blood and it manages to build off the formula in interesting ways. For example, players and the AI pick from a deck of cards to affect various aspects of a mission before it takes place. Arguments can be made, however, that it perhaps needed to take a few steps further outside of the shadow of its predecessor to make a mark, but the allure of that easy nostalgia grab is strong. Number 5. Final Fantasy VII The First Soldier on release, Final Fantasy VII was rightfully lauded as one of the best entries in the series and one of the most integral games of its genre. Then, Squaresoft went to work on the next game, as was their modus operandi. Final Fantasy sequels were unheard of back then, and it took a long time for Square to return to the world of FF7. In the mid-noughties, we had a spin-off, prequel, and CGI movie before it all went quiet until the eventual Final Fantasy VII remake in 2020. This game's success and thus renewed interest prompted another flurry of additional material, as always varying in quality. The most outrageous of all of this was The First Soldier, who'd have thought that this charming little 1997 JRPG could one day grow up to be a battle royale. Unsurprisingly, most Final Fantasy fans lean more towards role-playing over high-octane gun combat, so the concept wasn't all that appealing, and those that did enjoy The First Soldier found themselves tiring of it quickly as, even though it presented some novel ideas, it felt cramped and stunted by nature of being exclusively a mobile game. If Square Enix wanted a piece of the Fortnite pie, they could have done it in a myriad of ways. The laziest would have been to attach it to one of their most popular universes, so that's exactly what they did. Number 4. The Last of Us Part 1 Remake now, remaking the classics isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it really comes down to whether they need it or not. For example, there was only six years between the original Resident Evil and its much-loved remake, and the difference is night and day. The Last of Us, first released for PS3 in 2013, is hardly weathered by time. It's still pretty and still very much playable. Regardless, Naughty Dog used the words from the ground up to talk about the remake which made some sense. The Last of Us Part 2 had improved the exploration, puzzle and gameplay elements of the first, and if this re-release was to bring the two more in line with each other, then perhaps it was a worthy endeavour. But clearly that's not what the company meant, and our first real look showed the gameplay essentially unchanged. Instead, The Last of Us Part 1 remake was more about graphical fidelity, divisively swapping out character face models, and, well, scamming your consumers. It costs how much? Of course, the biggest head-scratcher about this one is why anyone would fork out a full $70 for a remake of a game that is already available on PS5 in the form of its still very good and much more affordable remaster. Number 3. Nintendo Switch Sports the fourth best-selling game of all time is Wii Sports. Sure, it was packed in with the majority of Nintendo Wii consoles, but that's not much of a caveat considering it was the perfect way to demonstrate the console's motion controls and brought every family that owned a Wii around the television at least once. Even your grandparents have nostalgia for this one. 18 years on for the Wii version, the big end dropped Nintendo Switch Sports. At launch, the title only featured six games, and whilst Association Football was a surprising and welcome addition that used the Ring Fit Adventure leg strap, the rest of the sports don't really push the series forward. After all these years, we were still just playing bowling and tennis. It feels as though parts of Nintendo Switch Sports are very much at odds with each other. Surely the best thing about the original game, and this one, is playing locally with friends and family, so why is the progression system attached to online play? With online in mind then, why do the games feel less about depth and practice and more about dumb luck and randomness? There's no advancement or depth here, and whilst it might give you that nostalgic tingle for a moment, the fun can't last. Number 2. Sonic Origins Sonic the Hedgehog only ever does things in weird and confusing ways. Instead of doing a whole lot to commemorate three decades of existence, Sega decided that the Blue Blur's 31st anniversary was a better time to rush out another collection of classic hits. Sonic Origins consists of four games that are now all over 25 years old, priced at an ungodly $40 just for the standard edition. Still, it can be argued that a little more playtime has been added to the package via new mission modes, but the Sonic 3 & Knuckles portion in particular was marred with glitches 
challenges and anomalies. Post-launch, Simon Tomley, lead developer, made a statement to defend himself from criticisms of the package. Essentially, he wanted to work on the game until his team were happy with it, but Sega demanded Workplace Crunch to meet a strict deadline. Whilst the developers we can assume love Sonic and its community, Sega was clearly more interested in a nostalgic cash grab. As an added layer of exploitation, Sega decided to stop players from making their own little collection of Sonic titles. A month before Origins released, several games from its lineup were removed from online storefronts. From a business standpoint, it does make sense, but you'd better be sure that what you're offering instead is a fair replacement. Number 1. Call of Duty Modern Warfare Remastered Whilst the Call of Duty series continues to live on with pretty constant new releases, some of the earlier games in the franchise remain king. The first Modern Warfare is a beloved entry that, for a long time, fans were passionate to see a remaster of. The way it happened, though, was a shambles of greed. Firstly, Modern Warfare Remastered was announced to be exclusive to limited editions of Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, a game that longtime players had already reacted badly to. Now, in order to play this revitalised classic, they had to spend out even more on a game they didn't necessarily want. The cynicism didn't end there. A few weeks after release, an update to Modern Warfare Remastered brought the dreaded microtransactions. This once innocent game from a bygone era was now scarred with the pay-to-win aspects that had plagued later entries of the series. Still, Activision cared not, and carried on regardless. Perhaps the most offensive move was reintroducing the game's original DLC. Unlike other remasters, however, where this typically was free, the variety map pack would be priced higher than it had been when it first appeared in 2007. Activision twisted the knife into the backs of players who had opted in for Modern Warfare Remastered every step of the way. And the worst part is, they completely got away with it too. And that's the list. Let us know what you thought of this video down in the comments below and any other nostalgic cash grabs in gaming that you can think of. There's plenty more out there. Make sure you like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe and hit that notification bell. I've been Cypher Culture, and have a good week.